Урок второй. Текст два. My tie. My pen. My life. Five ties. Ten pens. Seven beds. Tell Ted. Meet Bess. Send Ben. Tell me. Meet me. Send me. Find it. Send it. Spell it. Find my test. Send me my test. Meet me. Send Ted five ties. Send Bess nine pens. Let me meet Ted. Let me send it. Урок третий. Текст три. My name. My map. My plan. My flat. My lamp. A name. A map. A flat. A man. A plan. A bad day. A fine day. A bad plan. A bad pen. A nice lamp. It is a map. It is a lamp. It is a nice flat. It is a fine day. It is a bad plan. It's a map. It's a lamp. It's a nice flat. It's a fine day. It's a bad plan. Send Ben. Send Bess. And my plan. Lamp, please. Please tell Ben my name. My name's Anne. Send Ben my map, please. Send Bess my map and my plan, please. Урок четвертый. Текст четыре. A fine film. A bad bag. A black cap. A clean page. A thick match. The film. The bag. The cap. The page. The match. Ten films. Five bags. Nine caps. Seven pages. Ten matches. That cap. That match. A big bag. A black cap. Please give me a match, Jane. This is a bad match. Please give me that match. This is a bag. The bag's big. It's a big bag. That's a cap. The cap's black. It's a black cap. That's a thin pencil. Give me that pencil, please. Urok Piatti, text five. His name, his baby, his exam. A big city, a red tie, a thick pen, and clean, and read. Take text ten. Read page six. Is it black? Is it clean? Is it large? My name's Nick. This is my flat. It's large and clean. My flat's in Kiev. Kiev is a city. It's a big city. Is Kiev a city? Yes, it is. Is it a big city? Yes, it's very big. Find text six, Jack, and read it, please. My pen's bad. Please give me that red pen. Urok Shistoi, text six. 
Is this? Is that? Is the pen? Close the book. Good or bad? Short or long? Red or black? Thick or thin? Short to and go. A blackboard. This is a room. That is a blackboard. Look at it. It's black. These are maps. Those are pencils. Those pencils are not short. They are long. Please take the book, Tom, and open it and read note five. Close the book and go to the blackboard. Please go to the door and close it. Is this a pencil? Yes, it is. Is that a pencil? Yes, that's a pencil too. Is it short or long? It's short. Are those pencils short too? No, they aren't. Is that a book? Yes, it is. Is it a good book? No, it isn't. Good morning. Good evening. Uroksit moi. Text seven. A note or a text? A student or a teacher? A student or a schoolboy? At the table. On the table. From the table. This is my friend. He's a doctor. And I'm not a doctor. I'm a teacher. Bess is not a teacher. She's a student. We're in my room now. We're at the table. Please give me three cups, Bess. Thank you. Put a spoon into your cup, Fred. Are you a teacher? Yes, I am. Is your friend a teacher too? No, he isn't. Is that boy a student or a schoolboy? He's a schoolboy. Is this his briefcase? Yes, it is. Please, come in. Please, go out. Please, come into the room. Please, go out of the room. Urok vas moi. Text eight. Don't give. Read text one. Sit down. What's this? What's that? What's Kate? What color is it? Copy out this text. Tom is a schoolboy. This girl is his sister. She's a schoolgirl too. Her name's Kate. Please take your book out of your bag, Kate. Don't give me your book. Open it at page two and read text one. Thank you. Sit down, please. Your mark is good. Don't copy out this text now. Do it at home, please. What's this? It's an exercise book. What color is it? It's white. What's Kate? She's a schoolgirl. What's Kate doing now? She's reading. Are you reading too? No, I'm not. Urok Tiviati. Text nine. Where is he? His wife's there too. Who's this girl? It's their flat. My name's Bielov. I'm an engineer. My wife's not an engineer. She's a factory worker. Our son's a schoolboy. He's a pioneer. Mary and Kate are friends. Their sons are friends too. Who's your friend? My friend's Jack. He's an engineer. Is he here now? No, he isn't. Where is he? 
He's in Kiev. His wife's there, too. What are they doing there? They're visiting their friends. Whose flat's this? It's their flat. Who's this girl? She's my sister. What's her name? Her name's Mary. What is she? She's a schoolgirl. What kind of people is she? She's a good pupil. That's right. What's your name? Mary Smith. Urok Tisyate. Text 10. We're at a lesson. We're at the table. The ceiling's white. The wall's in our classroom. A piece of chalk. An English newspaper. We're at a lesson now. This is our classroom. It's small, but it's light and clean. The walls in our classroom are blue. The floor is brown. The ceiling's white. The door and the windows are white too. We're sitting at the table. It's brown. Brown too. Please come here, Jack. Don't take your book. Take a piece of chalk and write the new English words on the blackboard, please. Thank you. Write four questions at home, please. What's this? It's a newspaper. What kind of newspaper is it? It's an English newspaper. Where are you? We're at a lesson. What are you doing? We're writing. Основной курс. Lesson 1, the first lesson. We learn foreign languages. My name's Petrov. I live in the center of Moscow. I work at the Ministry of Foreign Trade. I'm an engineer, and I'm also a student. Many engineers in our ministry learn foreign languages. I learn English. We have our English in the morning. We're at a lesson now. Jane is standing at the blackboard. She's writing an English sentence. We aren't writing. We're looking at the blackboard. We don't often write in our class. Sometimes we have dictations. During the lesson, we read our textbook and do a lot of exercises. We don't often speak Russian in the class. We speak English to our teacher. We usually speak Russian after classes. Lesson two, the second lesson. We learn foreign languages continued. My wife is an economist. She works at the Ministry of Foreign Trade too. She goes to the office every day. My wife doesn't learn English. She already knows English very well. She reads very many English books, magazines, and newspapers. At the office, she sometimes writes letters to foreign firms. She often translates telegrams from English into Russian and from Russian into English. My wife's also a student. She learns German and is doing very well. She usually gets good marks and is always in time for the lessons. She likes languages very much and is going to learn French next year. Lesson three, the third lesson. The working day of an engineer. Comrade Petrov works at an office. He lives near the office. He usually walks there. He only works five days a week. He works on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. He doesn't work at the weekend. His working day lasts eight hours. He receives very many letters and telegrams in the morning and always answers them. He sometimes translates articles from foreign newspapers and journals. He often receives engineers from factories in the afternoon. They discuss a lot of questions with him. He usually finishes work at six o'clock in the evening. Lesson four, the fourth lesson. My friend is a children's doctor now. My friend's name is Peter. 
He and I are doctors now, but 11 years ago we were students at a medical college in Moscow. We lived a long way from the college, but we liked to walk there in fine weather. Our classes usually lasted till 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then we worked hard at home. We sometimes stayed after classes to play volleyball, but on weekdays we were usually at home by 9 o'clock. We received a lot of medical journals and often discussed interesting articles in them. In his third year, Peter decided to be a children's doctor, and now he works at a children's hospital in Kiev. He loves his work and often writes to me about it. Lesson 5, the fifth lesson. My last weekend. A week ago, my friend Boris Klimov came to Moscow from Leningrad. On Saturday, he came to see me and my family. We decided to spend the weekend together, and Klimov stayed with us till Monday. We woke up late on Sunday. We got up at nine o'clock, washed, and dressed. Then we had breakfast. What do you usually do on Sunday? Boris asked us at table. We often go to the country, my wife answered. Sometimes we go to the theatre or to the cinema. Do you often go to Central Park? He asked again. We went there last month. It's a very nice park. We like it very much. Do you want to go there, Boris? Oh, yes, I'd love to. The weather's very nice today. We went to the park with our children. We skated and skied, and the children played with their little friends. Lesson six, the sixth lesson. My friend's family. My friend's name is Lavrov. He lives in Moscow. His family is not very large. He has got a wife and two children. His wife's name is Mary and his children's names are Anne and Nick. Comrade Lavrov's wife is a young woman. She's 29 years old. She's a lecturer. She teaches English at the Institute of Foreign Languages. She's got very many students. She hasn't got bad students. Her students do well, as a rule. My friend's daughter is a girl of 10. She goes to school. She does a lot of subjects at school. She also learns English. She works hard and knows the language well. She doesn't make many mistakes in English. She's a pioneer. She likes reading. She also helps her mother at home. Comrade Lavrov's son is a little boy. I think he was born five or six years ago. His father takes him to a nursery school every day. Lesson seven, the seventh lesson. My sister's flat. My sister left her institute two years ago and went to work at Norilsk. She's an engineer and works at a factory. She got a very comfortable flat last month in a new block of flats. It's on the third floor. I got a letter from my sister on the 5th of March with several pictures of the city and her flat. This is a picture of my sister's flat. Look at it. There's a study and a bedroom in it, but there isn't a sitting room or a dining room. She has a living room and she uses it as a sitting room and a dining room. There's also a kitchen and a bathroom in her flat, but you can't see them in this picture. This is her living room. The walls in this room are yellow. The ceiling's white and the floor is brown. You can see a square table in the middle of the room. There's a vase of flowers in it. There's an armchair and a standard lamp in the corner. There's also a piano in the room. My sister plays the piano very well. She loves music. Lesson eight, the eighth lesson, at the library. We all learn foreign languages in our office. There's a library of foreign literature near us. We like to read books in foreign languages, so we often go there. There are always a lot of people there. Comrade Smirnova goes to the library too, 
because she hasn't got English books at home. She's in the library now. Good morning. Good morning. Have you got any interesting English books? Yes, we have some. Which English writers do you like? I like Dickens. I've read a lot of books by Dickens. Did you read them in English or in Russian? I read them in Russian in my childhood. I didn't know English then. When did you begin learning English? Two years ago. Then don't take any books by Dickens now. They are too difficult for you. Take a book by Oscar Wilde or Jack London. Their books are easy. Lesson nine, the ninth lesson. A telephone conversation. Hello, is that you, Mary? How are you? Why didn't you go to classes today? Hello, Anne. I felt very ill yesterday. I couldn't even get up. What was the matter with you? I don't know. I haven't seen the doctor yet. I had a high temperature. Can you go to the institute today? No, I'm afraid I can't. The doctor's coming this morning. I feel I should stay in bed for a few days. I'm very sorry I have to miss several lectures. That's all right. You mustn't come if you're ill. You should certainly stay in bed. You can have my notes if you like. Can I come and see you today? Certainly. Please come round after classes. Lesson ten, the tenth lesson. A letter to a friend. The twenty-third of June. Dear Victor, I'm very sorry I couldn't write to you last week, but I was very busy. At last, I've taken my literature examination, and I'm quite free. When my wife takes her last exam next week, we'll go to Yalta for a holiday. I hope we shall have a good time there. You know how we love the sea. We're going to swim, lie on the beach, and sunbathe two or three hours a day. You write that you can't forget the holiday which we spent there two years ago. I can't forget it either. I'm awfully sorry that you will not be able to go with us this year. When are you going to have your holiday? Is your wife's health still poor? I hope that she will soon be all right. How long do you intend to stay in the country? Is there a river and a wood there? I'll be back in early August in order not to miss my mother's birthday. She will be sixty on the tenth of August, you know. I hope I'll be able to go and see you sometime at the end of the month. I shall be very glad to hear from you before we leave. Love to you all, Boris. Lesson eleven. The eleventh lesson. A visit to Moscow. Mr. Smith is an old man. He's recently retired, and so he's got a lot of time for travelling. He's come to Moscow as a tourist. Now, he's sitting in the hotel hall and talking to Leonid Petrov, his guide. Petrov, is this your first visit to Moscow, Mr. Smith? Smith, yes, but I've heard a lot about Moscow from my father. He was here before the revolution. Moscow wasn't the capital then, was it? Petrov, quite right. It only became the capital in 1918. Smith. The city has changed very much. You can hardly recognize many of the streets and squares. I don't think young people like you remember the dirty, narrow streets my father saw in the suburbs, and in the center too, during his visit. Petrov, I'm afraid I don't. I wonder what you will say after you have seen our new district in the southwest. Smith, oh, I've heard about it from a friend. He told me it was a beautiful place with wide, straight streets and many gardens. We are going there, aren't we? Petrov. Yes, we'll see it on the way to the new building of Moscow University. Mr. Smith also said that he had heard a lot about the Tryetskov picture gallery, and would like to see it. Leonid told him that they were planning to see the gallery in a few days. They were also going to see towns and villages, hospitals, collective farms, 
museums, exhibitions, and many other interesting things. Mr. Smith hoped he would see several other important industrial and agricultural centers in the Soviet Union, in addition to Moscow. Lesson 12. The Twelfth Lesson. In the lunch hour. Meals. I usually have lunch at half past one, but yesterday I went to the office without breakfast. I only had a cup of tea, and by twelve o'clock I was already hungry. I don't like having lunch alone, so I said to Nick, let's have lunch together. All right, he answered. I'll join you in a few minutes. When we went to the canteen, there weren't many people there. We got tickets, checks, for lunch, sat down at a table near the window, and called the waitress. She brought knives, forks, spoons, and plates, and took our tickets, checks. Will you have any soup today? I asked Nick. No, I'm not very hungry, he said but I'll have some mineral water, salad, meat, and potatoes, and ice cream for the sweet. Oh, here's the waitress. The waitress brings the dishes. The salad's very good, but there's not enough salt in it. Will you pass me the salt, please? Certainly. Here it is. Thank you. Shall I pass you some rye bread? No, thank you. I usually have it with the soup, and I like white bread for the meat course. The waitress came up to us in a few minutes and asked if we would have coffee or tea. Yes, please. Tea for my friend and coffee for me, I said. Black or white? Black. And some cake, please. How do you like your tea, she asked my friend. Not very strong, he answered, and only two lumps of sugar, please. We talked a little when lunch was over, and at twenty-five to one went back to the office. We had a little time before work to read the newspaper and have a smoke. We began work again half an hour later. Lesson 13. The Thirteenth Lesson. They are leaving Moscow. If you look at the picture, you'll see a man, a woman, and a child in it. Would you like to know who they are, and why there are shirts, trousers, dresses, hats, suits, coats, shoes, and other things all over the place? The man's a friend of mine. His name's Oleg. He just graduated, and is now getting ready to go to his hometown. He's going to work as a doctor at a hospital, which was built a few months ago. You can see his little son busy packing. Some of his toys have already been packed in a box, and he's putting the rest of them in it. Oleg's wife, a young woman of about 22, is busy packing things too. What she's doing now? She's closing a suitcase. She must also go and get some food, but she won't go shopping until all the things have been packed. Oleg's writing his new address on the last box. As soon as he finishes writing it, all the boxes will be taken to the railway station. The taxi's already waiting at the door, so he's hurrying. You can't see his mother in the picture. She's making supper in the kitchen. In an hour and a half, their friends will come to say goodbye to Oleg and his family and wish them a happy life in the new place. Lesson 14. The 14th Lesson. A Sea Story. After W. W. Jacobs. We asked our friend Captain Brown one evening to tell us something interesting about his voyages. And he told us the following story. It was 15 years ago when I was a mate on the ship which was going to New York. We were having a very good voyage. The captain came up to me one morning and said, 
Last night I heard such a strange thing that I don't know what to do about it. I couldn't sleep, and I heard a voice which said in my ear, Sail north, northwest. Sail north, northwest. We must sail in that direction and find out. I'm very sorry, Captain, I said, but I think you had too much to eat last night, and that's why you couldn't sleep. The captain was very angry. I didn't eat much yesterday, he said, and I heard the strange voice three times, sir. The captain told the men to sail north, northwest. One of the men saw something black in the sea the next day. The captain looked through his glasses and said to me, There's a small boat there with a man in it. I was right last night, wasn't I? We must save him. Soon we reached the small boat and saw that the man in it was fast asleep. He went on sleeping while we took him into our boat and sailed towards the ship. When the man was aboard the ship, he suddenly opened his eyes and cried out loudly, Where am I? Where's my boat? Hello, said the captain. I'm very pleased that we have been able to save you. Did you order your men to take me out of my boat while I was asleep? The man asked. Of course, answered the happy captain. Did you want to be drowned in your little boat? Look here, said the man. My name's Captain Wilson, and I'm making a record voyage from New York to Liverpool in a small boat. Lesson 15. The 15th lesson. Shopping. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. Helen Petrovas in one of the biggest department stores in the city, which only opened a few weeks ago. Many things are bought and sold here every day. Though it's still early and the store has just opened, there are a lot of customers near the counters. Some are buying things. Others are just looking around. Helen. Excuse me, how do I get to the shoe department? Shop assistant. It's over there on the left, please. In the shoe department. Helen. I want a pair of boots, please. Shop assistant. What's your size? Helen. 34. And I want very warm ones, too. It's very cold outside. Shop assistant. Oh, yes. It's terribly cold. Thirty-four. You have very small feet. It won't be easy to find a suitable pair, I'm afraid. In a few minutes. These are nice boots, don't you think? Will you try them on? How do they feel? Helen. I think they are a size too big. Perhaps you can find a different pair. Can you give me a size smaller? Shop assistant. Just a moment. I'll have another look. You're lucky. Here's a lovely pair, but it's more expensive. Helen. That doesn't matter. It feels more comfortable. I think I'll take it. How much is it? Shop assistant. Seventy-five rubles. Helen, where do I pay? Shop assistant. Over there at the cash desk. Helen, thank you. After paying the bill. Shop assistant. Here are your boots. The check's inside. Helen, thank you. And where's the glove department? Another customer. Come along with me and I'll show you. Helen buys some dark brown gloves to match her new boots and looks at her watch. She sees that it is rather late, so she quickly leaves the store and hurries home. Lesson 16. The 16th lesson. From Verkhoyansk to Suhomi. I got up earlier than usual yesterday as I had to go to the airport to meet my old friend, Boris Petrov. 
We went to school together. Then we went to the same college in Moscow. But now we live in different parts of the Soviet Union. Boris lives and works in the north of our country, in Verkhoyansk, and I live by the sea in Sukhumi. I wrote to him a few months ago to invite him to my place for a holiday. Soon I got an answer. He thanked me heartily for the invitation and asked me to meet him at the airport on the 20th of April. I hope you won't mind if I bring my wife and my son with me, he wrote. When I went out, it was very warm, though it was early morning. The air was fresh, the sky was blue, and the sun was shining. In Sukhumi, it's usually very fine in April. It doesn't often rain, and it's not very hot yet. I like Sukhumi at this time of year best of all. I took a taxi and started for the airport. I'm afraid I may be late, I said to the driver, and asked him to go faster. We reached the airport in time. The plane was just landing. It was only half past six in the morning, but it was as warm as in the afternoon. The passengers were getting out of the plane. I went up to the plane and saw a group of people who looked very funny in this warm weather. All of them had warm winter clothes on. Hello, glad to see you, I said, when I recognized Boris in the group. Hello, old man. This is my wife and my son, Boris said. Pleased to meet you. I hope you had a good journey, I said. Aren't you dressed a bit too warmly? It's not so cold here as in Verhoangst, is it? I think it's just a little warmer, Boris agreed and laughed. But when we left home, it was snowing hard, and we weren't at all hot. Do you know how cold it was there that day? You won't believe it. Almost 35 degrees below zero, let alone the biting winds. Ah, well, take off your coats, and let's hurry home. The taxi's waiting. It won't take us long. I'm sure you'll like it here. Lesson 17. The 17th lesson. The United Kingdom. The UK, short for the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, is situated on two large islands called the British Isles. The larger island is Great Britain, which consists of three parts, England, Scotland, and Wales and the smaller is Ireland. Southern Ireland, now called Eyre, or the Irish Republic, is independent of the UK. The country is washed by the Atlantic Ocean, the North Sea, and the Irish Sea, which is between Great Britain and Ireland. If you travel to England from the Soviet Union, it will take you two days to pass through several countries on the continent by train and six more hours to cross the English Channel by boat. You can also fly there, and then the journey will only take you three and a half hours. There are mountain chains in Scotland, Wales, and northwest England, but they are not very high. Northwest England is also famous for its beautiful lakes. The longest river in England is the Severn, and the deepest is the Thames, on which stands the capital of England, London. The UK is a highly developed industrial country. She exports machinery, vessels, motors, and other goods. One of her main industries is the textile industry, and a lot of British textiles are exported. The UK buys more goods than she sells because she has to import food products and raw materials from many countries of the world, including the Soviet Union. Lesson 18. The 18th lesson. The childhood and youth of Dickens. Charles Dickens, one of the greatest and most popular English novelists, was born on the 7th of February, 1812, in a small English town. He was a weak child, 
and did not like to take part in noisy and active games. The little boy was very clever and learned to read at an early age. He read a lot of books in his childhood. When he was about six, someone took him to the theater for the first time. He saw a play by Shakespeare and liked it so much that he decided to write a play of his own. When it was ready, he performed it with some of his friends. Everybody enjoyed the performance and the little writer felt very happy. When Dickens was nine years old, the family moved to London where they lived in an old house in the suburbs. They had a very hard life. There were several younger children in the family besides Charles. The future writer could not even go to school because at that time his father was in the Marshalsea debtor's prison. There was nobody in London to whom Mr. Dickens could go for money and his wife with all the children except Charles went to join him in the prison. The family lived there until Mr. Dickens could pay his debts. Those were the most unhappy days of all Charles's life. The boy worked from early morning till late at night to help his family. Charles was only able to start going to school when he was nearly 12 and his father was out of prison. He very much wanted to study but he did not finish his schooling. After two years of school, he began working again. He had to work hard to earn his living and tried very many trades, but he did not like any of them. His ambition was to study and become a well-educated man. At the age of 15, he often went to the famous library of the British Museum. He spent a lot of time in the library reading room he read and studied there, and in this way, he got an education. Later, Dickens described his childhood and youth in some of his famous novels, among them Little Dorrit and David Copperfield. The great writer died more than a hundred years ago, in 1870, but everybody still enjoys reading his books. Lesson 19 the 19th lesson, the Lavrovs. It happened during the Great Patriotic War when the Soviet people fought against the German fascists defending the freedom and independence of the country. In 1943, Alexei Lavrov was on the front. One day, after a fierce battle, when the Soviet army had defeated the enemy unit and liberated a small village, he went into one of the village houses. He didn't see anybody at first. Then he heard a weak voice. Turning around, he saw a thin, pale boy of about eight. What are you doing here? Is there anyone else in the house? Where are your parents? Lavrov asked him. There's nobody else here. My parents have been killed, the boy answered. Please don't leave me here. I'm afraid to stay in this house. Alexei decided to take the boy with him, though he didn't know what he would do with him on the front. He couldn't leave the child alone there. He just couldn't. All the soldiers and officers liked the boy. He stayed with them a month, but then Alexei realized he couldn't keep the child on the front any longer. He didn't know what to do. Luckily, a delegation of workers, among whom there was a girl of about 18, came to the front from Moscow. Lavrov asked her to take the boy with her, and she agreed gladly. Early next morning, the unit was unexpectedly ordered to change its position and get ready for an advance. And Alexei had no time to have a word with the girl or even ask her address. One day, in 1952, Lavrov was going home after the May Day Civil Parade when suddenly somebody called out to him. Turning round, he saw an old friend named Pavlov. Hello, Pavlov said, smiling. Glad to see you. 
I don't think we've met since 1945. Alexei was also pleased to see him. They talked of old times and their friends. By the way, Pavlov said, are you spending the evening with your family? I'm afraid I haven't got a family yet, Lavrov answered, and I haven't made up my mind yet where to go. Then come to my place at eight o'clock this evening, Pavlov said. Alexei was delighted, and at exactly eight he was knocking at Pavlov's door. He went into the room and was introduced to the guests. Everybody was enjoying the party. Some of the guests were dancing, others were talking, laughing and joking, when somebody began to play the piano and sing a beautiful song. Everybody stopped talking at once. At that moment, two more guests appeared. They were a young woman and a boy of about 16. As soon as they came into the room, they too stopped near the piano, listening to the singer. When Alexei looked at the woman, he thought that he had met her somewhere before, but he couldn't remember where it was. He no longer listened to the song. He looked at the woman, trying to remember where he had seen her. The boy called her mother, but she didn't look more than 25. Alexei went up to Pavlov and asked him, don't you think that that mother is too young for her son? Well, he is not really her son, Pavlov answered. In 1943, an officer asked her to take a little boy from the front to Moscow, and, interrupting him, Alexei cried out, Of course! That's who it is! And that is the end of the story. Now you understand why there is a difference of 20 years between the Lavrov's two sons, don't you? Lesson 20. The Twentieth Lesson. An incident from the life of a Russian revolutionary. Every worker must understand that the only way to a happy future is through struggle. And the struggle is growing harder and harder. On the one hand, a knock at the door interrupted Bauman. He stopped speaking and first looked at the people sitting round him and then at the dentist, in whose waiting room they were having their secret meeting. Are you expecting any patients? he asked. Everyone understood what Bauman's question meant. They didn't even have to speak to each other. They didn't have to be reminded what to do. One of them accompanied the dentist into the surgery, while the others sat down on the chairs, standing along the wall, and pretended to be patients waiting their turn. It didn't take them long. When everything was ready, the dentist's maid went to answer the knock, and soon came back with an unexpected visitor, who tried to go straight into the surgery. I say, it isn't your turn, a patient sitting next to the door, said to him. I can't wait. I've got a terrible toothache, the man answered, hurriedly examining everybody's face. Bauman, who pretended he was reading a newspaper, didn't even turn his head to look at the strange visitor. He could, however, clearly see the man's face and recognized him at once. He was a spy, the same man he had often seen before. Has he brought the police with him? One thing was clear. It was necessary to keep the spy in the flat as long as possible, so that he would believe that they were real patients. Bauman looked up at the newcomer, and for a moment it seemed to him that there was joy in the man's eyes. Then Bauman said as politely as he could, We don't mind if the dentist sees him first, do we? And then, turning to the spy, since you have a bad toothache, you can go next. The spy didn't know what to say. At that moment, the surgery door opened, and the dentist asked the next patient in. Bauman, who went on watching the spy, 
immediately said, anyone with bad teeth should certainly have them out. In a second, the spy was sitting in the dentist's chair. The dentist told him to open his mouth wide, examined his teeth with great care, and began working quickly. A quarter of an hour later, he showed the patient two large yellow teeth and said, I did my best. To tell you the truth, it was quite a serious operation. You should take better care of your teeth. Ten rubles, please. For a minute, the spy stood there, not knowing what to do. Would you like me to do anything else for you? The dentist asked, smiling. The spy answered nothing, paid the money, and hurried out into the waiting room. He expected to find no one there. But to his great surprise, everyone was in his place. The spy could do nothing but leave the dentist's flat. When the spy had left, someone said, it's a good thing he had bad teeth. But he didn't. He just has two good teeth less now than he did when he came in, the dentist explained, and added, it didn't cost him much, so he should be grateful. Everybody laughed, and Bauman said, that was a good idea. Didn't I say that they would break their teeth if they fought against us? I wonder whether he will be able to go and report to the police after that. I don't think they'll be able to make out anything he says. Well, I think we can go on with our meeting now.